and it's with great pleasure I welcome you to Reports from the Frontier, the present and future of Australian psychedelic research. And our panel facilitator today is Dr. Chris Letherby. All right, thanks for coming everyone. So I'm going to start by introducing our distinguished panelists going from my side to that side. I'm not gonna bother with left and right because that'll just get confusing. Um, and then uh, for the first part of the panel, I'll be asking people individually questions that then others will have a chance to weigh in on as well. Um, and at the end, I'll put uh, one or two or three questions to the whole panel. So we're very fortunate to have on this panel, first of all, um, Dr. Karen Hitchcock, who is a specialist physician and fellow of the Royal Australian College of Physicians. Dr. Hitchcock was one of Australia's first authorised prescribers of medicinal cannabis and is currently a trial therapist in the St. Vincent's Hospital End of Life Psilocybin Trial. Dr. Hitchcock holds a PhD in English Literature and is an award-winning writer of fiction and non-fiction focusing on medicine and society. So that's Dr. Karen Hitchcock. Next, we have Dr. Vince Polito. Um, Vince is a senior research fellow in the Department of Cognitive Science at Macquarie University in Sydney. His work explores cognitive and neurological changes across a range of altered states of consciousness. He's investigated meditation, psychosis, states of flow, hypnosis, chanting, virtual reality, and psychedelics. He's particularly interested in microdosing and is chief investigator on a large clinical trial investigating low doses of psilocybin as a possible treatment for depression. Um, looks like I've actually got the order of the panelists pretty close to right on my sheet that I prepared earlier. Next, we have Dr. Margaret Ross. Um, Marg is a clinical psychologist and works in palliative medicine at St. Vincent's Hospital, Melbourne. She's the chief principal investigator and clinical lead for Australia's first psychedelic-assisted therapy study treating depression and anxiety in the terminally ill. Marg has worked clinically in both inpatient and outpatient psychiatry as a research fellow with Uni Melb after completing her doctorate, which focused on complex PTSD. And for the past decade, she's worked clinically in cancer and palliative care. That's Dr. Margaret Ross. Next up, we have uh, Renee Harvey. Uh, Renee is a clinical psychologist who's quite recently moved to Australia and has come with skills and experience in the field of psychedelic psychotherapy in the UK, having worked as an honorary research fellow and assistant guide in the Imperial College London trial researching psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. Renee is currently assisting as a therapist on the psilocybin trials at St. Vincent's Hospital and is really enjoying becoming familiar with the field in Australia, making contacts with the leading folks in the field and hoping to make a contribution in training and research. Renee Harvey. Finally, we have Dr. Martin Williams, um, who is one of the pioneers of psychedelic clinical research in Australia, having collaborated with Marg to initiate the St. Vincent's Hospital Melbourne clinical trial, with Dr. Steve Bright on the ECU MDMA PTSD study, and with Professor Susan Rossell at Swinburne on several trials both underway and in the pipeline. Martin is founding president and executive director of Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine, or PRISM, and founding vice president of EGA. So that's Dr. Martin Williams. And so you can see that this panel is very well qualified to talk about our theme, um, the present and future of Australian psychedelic research. Um, unfortunately, we had to shrink the focus from Australasian psychedelic research when Suresh Muthukumaraswamy was no longer able to participate. But I'm gonna start the panel um, with a question for Marg, which is, um, after lagging behind the rest of the world for a long while, um, in the last three or four years, psychedelic research in Australia has come along in leaps and bounds. And of course, everything that we're hearing about at this event is a testament to that. So the question is, why now? What changed? Um, aside from luck? No, that is not true. Um, I think organisations like PRISM, EGA and the Australian Psychedelic Society did a hell of a lot to promote the dialogue about the science. Um, that's actually where I heard about it, and I'll talk about that in my, my talk uh, coming up next, but um, they had done a lot to sort of pave the way to talk about the science and really good science, so it wasn't just, you know, um, just about, you know, evidence-based drug law reform. They were actually talking about the science that was coming out of the US and the UK, and um, certainly that's where it piqued my interest. I think... Um, so you kind of, you only, uh, you, you can go on the, the shoulders of the, the people that come before you and it was um, only through meeting uh, with Martin 
actually, who really kind of schooled us up um, to get our trial ready and to write a protocol that was going to be basically uh, difficult for the ethics committee to say no to. Um, uh, so it was really about kind of schooling up in the science. I think that we were um, lucky, I think, at the same time, culturally, so, like from a sociocultural perspective, there was a lot of talk about psychedelics. I think there were podcasters talking about it. Michael Pollan dropped his book, How to Change Your Mind, which has been a, both a blessing and a curse <laughs> in some ways. Um, so there was a, a big shift in public sentiment around that time. So uh, we, were, we were pretty lucky that we got um, conditional approval um, first off the bat, I think, as well. <clears throat> One of the things I was mindful of is I, I went in as a clinician um, who had kind of flirted with academia, but I didn't have my neck on the chopping block in that regard. I think it was, you know, publish or perish. A lot of researchers were very reluctant to get into controversial areas um, at that time. Psychedelics was, you know, I, I guess a, a contro controversial area of research. Um, and I was certainly motivated as a clinician seeing my, my patients suffering and not responding to treatment. So, um, so I, I didn't have, I guess, much to lose from, a, from an academic point of view. And then I think since then there's been quite a bit of um, interest and, and um, yeah, there's actually been a surge of interest in, in, from an academic point of view as well. So, but I'd like to throw it to Martin as well because I think as being one of the pioneers and the elders of, of this area, it would be wonderful to hear from you. Pioneer is a word I'm happy to, to accept, but elder is not okay. one that I know. It sits very, very well with me. Um, yeah, look, thanks very much. I think uh, on top, of, beyond what uh, Marg was saying, is that um, really there was, there's been a global sort of shift in, in awareness and consciousness, consciousness for, for quite a number of years. And in certain ways, we haven't been quite as far behind the, um, the global sort of awareness as might have seemed the case. So we've been running these conferences for quite, a some, uh, quite some time. We have been inviting uh, global researchers to Australia for EGA conferences since about 2007, I think. So things were really starting to, so I guess a foundation was starting to form. Uh, way back in 2004, I think, when I was sitting some classes at Uni Melbourne, they used to laugh at me when I mentioned the word psychedelics. And it was really... Um, career suicide for any researcher to be considering this as a as a as a move, career move, or, or or even a part of their research sort of project. And so it was to take about a, well, 10, 12 years, I guess, before things started to turn the corner. And I think um, we're now in the happy situation where where psychedelics is actually a legitimate topic of dinner table conversation with our grandparents. You know, it's been a, such a shift in awareness and acceptance. But on the other hand, I think there, there were probably quite, there's probably quite a number of people who were aware of what was going on um, because we couldn't have done this from a zero base. Um, so they were aware of what was happening, but they were just waiting for their moment, you know, waiting for the circumstances to get to the point at which we could start to um, really move the dialogue forward. And of course, there are several other factors, which I'm sure we'll discuss very soon, but one of those was funding. One of those was, as, as we said, academic preparedness to go ahead with this. Um, and then the third was probably acceptance in the, um, the public sphere. Uh, including um, quite possibly the medicalization of psychedelics, which is a contentious topic. I think we should discuss that a fair bit this afternoon or this evening. Um, so yeah, those, those points, just to wrap things up, I think have all come into play. And so in, in some ways, without getting too celestial about things, I think the stars really did align around sort of 2016, 2017. Um, and so essentially, we had funding come together. We had uh, the academics who were waiting for things to happen. We've got a whole bunch of new people who are really looking forward to getting involved as well. So we've got a new generation of researchers coming along, and we've actually got a whole generational shift so that... Um, uh, I guess things happen in sort of a skipping generation. So if we're looking at the 60s through the early 70s, then we had the, the, the wasteland, you know, and then I think basically the, from the uh, mid-2000s through to now has really made the, 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 the beginnings of the next phase. So this is the dawning of the new age of whatever it might be. Great. Thanks, uh, Marg and Martin. Uh, did anyone else have anything to say on that one? Anyone want to chime in? I think maybe it's just worth acknowledging. Just really when we say a lot has happened in the last years how much has happened like I think at the last Eldon EGA five years ago there was no psychedelic studies in Australia there's probably five studies currently recruiting at the moment and, and maybe double that set to start in the next year so it's, it's an absolutely massive change in a small amount of time things really 
have taken off. Yeah. Great. That's actually a perfect segue to uh, my next question, Vince, which is for you, which is, um, I mean, you have a, a psychedelic research program at Macquarie. You're involved in studying microdosing empirically. Um, how did you go about starting a psychedelic research program and um, what reactions did you get from colleagues, ethics boards, these kinds of entities? Yeah, okay. Um, well, before working on psychedelics, I had worked on altered states for most of my academic career. I did my PhD on hypnosis and then did some work on meditation and states of flow and religious ritual and quite a few things broadly in this area. But even having done all of that, it, I did feel like psychedelics were a bit of a taboo topic. And even though I was very interested, it felt like something that was a little bit unattainable as a, as a research topic. And it kind of changed around the time that microdosing started to become very popular because um, that just seemed like such a mix of things that were interesting to me because it was this element of psychedelics, but it was also this element of belief formation and expectation, which a lot of my other work had been on. And so I decided, okay, like this is the time to, to try and start doing something. And the first study we did was a prospective observational study where we were just tracking people who were microdosing over time. We weren't giving substances. We were just finding people already microdosing and tracking what they did through an online system. And that now looking back on it seems like a very tame, uncontroversial kind of study, but I was pretty nervous when we first put that together and our ethics committee certainly uh, evaluated it rigorously and they asked for a lot of feedback and so we had a couple of rounds of back and forths before we assured them that it was okay and unlike any other ethics application that I'd done before, I had this whole extra appendix of laying out the sort of different forms of risk and why I thought this was important. And they eventually agreed to let us do it and we collected the data. And again, once we sort of got up to the point of publishing, I was a bit nervous about the reaction that it would get and if the, you know, what my colleagues would think or the university would think. But actually, um, everyone was really encouraging. I had a lot of colleagues kind of congratulate me on the work and say that they thought it was really interesting. And it, it made me think like, oh, okay, maybe I should have started to do this quite a bit earlier. I think I was maybe a little bit uh, overly cautious in, in my approach. But also, as Martin said, I think attitudes did just change a lot around that time. And so it was just fortunate timing. Um, and then to kind of get from that stage of just starting to do some observational research to now where we're just about to begin a, a quite a large clinical trial where, where we'll be administering substances was really um, just steps of uh, in increasingly involved naturalistic and observational studies. So after that initial mainly online study, we sort of moved into a hybrid kind of design where we weren't giving people microdoses, but we were getting people who were already microdosing to come into the lab and we would look at their brains in a um, MEG scanner. And so we had very well controlled measures, but not very well controlled administration of drugs. And so um, that study is still just kind of winding up now. We're doing the last batch of recruitment and having done these sort of steps and demonstrated that we sort of understood the area and that we were being cautious, it now hasn't been as big a jump to move into the clinical trial area now that we've got some funding to do that. And ethics has been, you know, after being a bit slow at the start, relatively supportive, and the university's been fairly supportive now. So it's just kind of built up slowly, I guess, through, through those steps. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Vince. Um, anyone else want to weigh in comments on nuts and bolts of getting a psychedelic research program started, reactions from colleagues, ethics committees? All right, so I'm going to go to <laughs> Renee next, um, and I wondered, Renee, if you could say something about the clinical challenges that you see in providing psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy to people outside of research settings, which of course is going to be something that is more and more relevant in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Sure, I think there are definitely some challenges because the research uh, protocols and the research sort of the whole world is, um, is, is, is quite refined. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really reflect a lot of the real clinical realities that we see out there. People who come along every day, I, I work in private practice, and you know we see this. We see the, the complications that people can come with. And um, so th the challenge is going to be, first of all, we're working with people who don't quite fit those profiles that the research studies uh, are built around. And um, the other thing is that the clinicians and therapists like myself will behave quite differently when we're doing therapy that goes 
more widely. It encompasses the whole treatment journey, the whole therapy journey more widely than just the preparation, the dosing, and the uh, integration. So that's one of them, clinically. And then, of course, there are issues around funding and around um, how we actually, I think, train clinicians and make it more accessible to people. Great, thanks. Yeah, anyone else want to weigh in? Any comments on these, this whole set of issues and challenges? I would, I would absolutely agree. I think the, the difficulty... Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, the, the difficulty is we're so sanitised in terms of who we can accept into these trials. So it means then that we've got a very small subsection of the population. <clears throat> and as this gets rolled out, we're going to see um, potential problems creep in here. Um, and I think, you know, the phase three studies... Uh, where you have more people, you know, they may relax the protocols a little bit slightly, but it's still, you know, um, quite sanitised. But that's, that's going to be the area where we're going to pressure test this a little bit more. So we may see more things like adverse events coming up um, and more of a clearer profile of who this may not be so great for um, or where we need, um, in some instances, more preparation, lower doses, more frequent doses. So we're still trying to figure that out, and I think that... Um, We've, we've still actually got quite a long way to go in terms of how this is going to look when it is implemented as a, as a treatment if things continue the way that they're going. It looks like it will be an approved treatment probably within the next couple of years, two, three years for psilocybin, probably even less for, for MDMA. <clears throat> but I think, yeah, getting a, a sense of what that's going to look like is something we're still, um, still unsure about. Mm -hmm. I can just add something yeah. else, and that is that Traditionally, these medicines have been used in cultural, in yeah. uh, group settings, yeah. and we aren't anywhere near replicating that. And we know how healing that is, having communities of support. Yeah. Um, and uh, the challenge then is, how do we do that within a medicalised system where mm. uh, someone goes along, gets individual treatment, and mm. you know the, the, the families aren't really formally yeah. involved? Yeah. Certainly not as much in depth as they are, mm. as, or as they should be. Martin, were you going to weigh in? I've got so many ideas, I don't even know where to start. So let's, let's. Um, I'm sure they'll come up in the course of the. Yeah. All right, no yeah. worries. Um, so, Karen, I want to put something to you now, and this is that you know, for quite a while, it seemed as though the results from psychedelic clinical trials, clinical trials of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, were sort of uniformly amazing, with maybe the odd blip here and there. But in recent times, we've started to see that the trial results are not always amazing. You know, sometimes they seem a bit more equivocal. Sometimes it's not really clear whether the effect is as large as we'd expected or whether it really is superior to other kinds of treatments. So what should we think about that? I mean, how should we respond and what should we um, conclude when the results from clinical trials are less than amazing? Yeah, so I think that's really interesting. We're trying to squash psychedelic psychotherapy, both of which are incredibly complex, into this RCT, randomised control trial paradigm that medicine has uh, worked with for years now. And I think even if we just look at psychotherapy alone and forget the psychedelic, the College of Psychiatrists has recently uh, released their guidelines for treating depression, and they, they uh, have said that uh, psychodynamic therapy, so therapy that actually uh, is interested in what's happened throughout your life and how that might be impacting how you feel now, is not recommended because it's not evidence-based. So the only treatments that are evidence-based, that is that in a randomised controlled trial, has been shown to be successful or better than placebo are cognitive behavioural therapy and antidepressants, both of which are suppressive therapies that stop you feeling, stop you thinking about, oh, you're feeling anxious, think about butterflies or whatever the hell CBT is. So they're the only things, like, they fit really well into that randomised controlled trial paradigm that medicine, with its obsession with receptors and noxious stimuli, that's the only way. This uh, psychotherapy is an intricate, intimate interplay of a relationship relationship between two or if you have two therapists, three mm -hmm. people, that is so difficult, the effects of that, to put into a questionnaire that you fill out, a, a validated questionnaire that you fill out at the end of your treatment. I mean, and still just thinking about psychotherapy, sometimes the insights that you have or the 
uh, that the realizations or whatever happen years mm -hmm. after the therapy has finished and that you keep that within you and like no questionnaire is going to pick that up and and then you have psychedelics you know the, the main word we use about a psychedelic experience is ineffable how are you going to I mean like non-expressible how does that fit into a 20 question questionnaire I mean it's just so difficult for uh, to see the therapeutic outcomes of this very complex psychotherapy and very complex drug put together. It's so difficult to somehow squash that into this uh, traditional medical model of the randomised control trial. I mean, you can't even um, uh, blind the b clinicians or the patients to whether or not they've had... A, you've either had a psychedelic or you haven't. I mean, you can't, uh, with a bit of niacin, think that you've, you're having a mushroom trip. So I think that it's... I don't even know what we're going to do if we should be... Uh, uh, changing the way we think about research, if we should be doing qualitative studies. The follow-up has to be very long, if it can be, etc. I think it's very difficult and we're sort of all pretending that we're going to fit this into an RCT tra framework because we're trying to toe the line, fit in with the medical paradigm, get this accepted by the professors and the colleges and the whatever. And I just think that it would be better if we could just step back and just go, this is bullshit, actually, when it comes to psychedelic psychotherapy and even when it comes to psychotherapy. And can we just do something that is going to actually be better? But I don't know how that's... We just have to charge on try and get the colleges to accept us. <laughs> All right, great. So um, this is really interesting. Martin wants to weigh in here. I also would like to uh, just sort of, and maybe this is what you're going to speak to, Martin, but this is a, a question that interests me deeply, which is um, supposing this is all true, right? Supposing it's just not viable to squash psychedelic psychotherapy into the RCT framework, what should we do instead? Because we have to, you know, how can we figure out if this really works or not? Because I think my position is we must at least acknowledge the possibility that a good chunk of it is suggestibility and placebo and not a real treatment effect. So how, if not by the double-blind RCT method, how do we discriminate between the hypotheses that it's a real treatment effect versus it's placebo and suggestibility and whatever? So I don't know if that's what you're going to talk about, Sorry. Martin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We've got 20 minutes to go, and Karen's just jumped to straight to the end of this whole conversation. So I don't know how we're, where we're going to go from here. But um, what really fascinates me is that uh, psychedelics have been described as, um, let's see, disruptive psychopharmacology or you know pharmacological agents. Um, I think the main idea was that they disrupt the patient or the participant or whoever takes them, um, their mental processes. So that's obviously on the first sort of top level, but um, I see it more deeply than that. I think psychedelics could be disruptive of the whole medical model. Um, and I think we, we, we paradigm, unfortunately, um, and Chris and I have had a couple of chats about this, is, is a, I think, a grossly overused used and misinterpreted term. But I do, I do agree to a certain degree that we're we are experiencing something of a paradigm shift in the medical model. Uh, and so I, my sense is that as researchers, as well as trying to find the best ways to, to help people, um, I think we should also find the best ways to disrupt the medical model and, and find ways to move forward as, as a humanity because um, there are, there are two, two words which came to mind. This is where Chris sort of caught me out before because he could see all these sort of thoughts sort of writing themselves across my face. Um, I guess we've got two words, zeitgeist and uh, zeitgeist, sorry, poor pronunciation and schadenfreude. And, uh, and so zeitgeist means sort of the, the time, you know, the time, the temper of the time. Um, schadenfreude, I think, is much harder to define, but we are collectively going through a lot of shit at the moment. And so um, it seems to people that, that psychedelic therapies or psychedelics more generally could be very helpful, but I think we need to explore that more carefully because um, we need to be careful to avoid too many blind alleys if we want to get where we need to go uh, in, a, in a reasonable period of time. Thanks, Martin. Any other comments? Anyone want to weigh in on, you know, the next paradigm in psychiatry? <laughs> Well, I, so I was going to say, I, say I can't give you a standing ovation. I'll be deregistered, but I do believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it's absurd that we're, we're trying to put psychotherapy and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy into an RCT model. Um, and just to quickly touch on what you said in terms of the placebo effect, we're actually seeing the nocebo effect. So they're not getting the psychedelic, they're getting de depressed because they're not getting it. So it's a, um, we've, we've got a whole host of, of new problems here that, um, as a result of trying to squash this into this model. And it is a flawed model. It's a flawed model anyway. Um, it, but it is the unfortunate gold standard that um, helps treatments get approval with FDA. So we have to do that in that way. I think something that I've seen recently, just to touch on that again, this, um, the idea that patient story, so people's story in their own words, impact statements um, from having various treatments and so forth is starting to get more weight now with things like TGA and FDA as well, um, which is useful because this is rich qualitative data. You cannot capture this in a checklist. We are forced to use checklists because that's something that we have to do. You know, depression, anxiety and so forth, and yeah, it's validated and so forth. But how on earth can you capture the experience of someone who has gone through a psychedelic experience and therapy and um, come out of that with a tick box? where you have five responses, five, you know, a score of one to five, and I, okay, this is, a, it's absurd. It's absurd. Um, yeah, so that was all I had to add there. But um, we, do, we do need a, a paradigm shift, and I really am hopeful that we can um, start talking about what that would look like. Um, yeah, these are... The, you know, the very nature of psychedelics is that they cause you to question, you know, um, existing power structures, and that may not be a bad thing. So, yeah. Thanks, Marge. Karen, you were going to... Oh, just talking about paradigm, sh paradigm shifts. I mean, psychedelics, as Martin w was just saying, they do sort of blow out many paradigms. And if we think about Western medicine, which has always thought about the human subject as a mind and a body completely separate, and things affect this and things affect this, which if you look at Indigenous traditional practices that have incorporated psychedelics in the past, they don't have a conception of the human being that is a mind and a body. It is much more complex biopsychosocial, spiritual and so I think that not only do we have difficulties fitting this into the RCT framework but we have we're really struggling with how do you translate something that we're calling psychedelic psychotherapy into Western medicine's conception of the human being, which is bullshit and not really helpful actually for most of the, the people who are suffering and so, the problem is as well on that, the difficulty is, and you, you see this in psychology and psychiatry, we don't do the spiritual. We don't talk about it. It's not, it's not delved into. And it is all, you know, this is the realm of the spiritual and, um, and transcendent experiences. And so uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, clinicians moving into the field going, how do I do? And, and it's going to feel awkward and clunky and they're not going to be able to kind of deal with this. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting period of, of, of learning a whole other way of, of understanding uh, the person in front of you as a therapist. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. Well, in my view, the territory we're in at the moment is not contentious enough, so I'm going to put a question to Martin. Uh, and the question is this. We're now seeing the entry of corporate players into the psychedelic research space in Australia through partnerships with academic and health institutions. What are the implications of this development? Pulled the short straw on that one, didn't I? Um, yeah, we had an interesting chat yesterday, which I think was really just the beginning. Sorry, on Friday we had had a, a live stream panel. I think that was really just the we just touched touched on so many aspects of that. But look, if we're working within the the medical research model and for all its strengths and weaknesses, um, it it it's about maybe the best we've got right at the moment, but. It costs. It, it costs a lot in terms of time, resources, and fundamentally money. Um, and so, the reality is, we we are generally, broadly, in the Western world, existing within the within the the system based on capital and capital exchange, and valuing people's time and energy resources and so on. So, um, that is perhaps for the time being, the, the most fruitful um, and promising approach to this rather flawed system. Now, um, 
we have a we have an academic structure which is really hurting at the moment. It has to be said, uh, given the last couple of very difficult years, uh, and research funding is is very thin on the ground. Um, I think we we're probably uh, going to realise over the next few years that the returns from psychedelic therapies to the um, to whichever organisations, not necessarily companies, are um, creating and producing the medicines themselves, that the returns are relatively small. But nonetheless, I think we need to make do with whatever we, we can at the moment. So um, my sense is that for the time being, what we call public-private partnerships between academic institutions which provide the skills on an, on an ongoing and growing basis in terms of students coming up, research researchers coming up through the system, and a, a corporate or semi-corporate model which provides funding with a view to some return on the investment that is probably about as good as we can hope for the time being, um, unless we have a radical shift in the valuation of both the health of the community and the future health of the community. So I think this is these are bringing up some pretty big questions and I'm not sure that we have the time to, to really work through all of those now, but I would throw that out as uh, perhaps food for everybody's thought. Yep. Sure, thanks. Anyone else want to weigh in on this one? No one. All right. So in that case, at this point, um, I'm going to put a question to the whole panel, um, and it's this. What recommendations can you offer to people in Australia or Australasia who want to become psychedelic researchers? Anyone at all? Yeah, I can, I can suggest a couple of things. I mean, I feel like there's a, a lot of people that are interested in this and want to get into it, and I, I guess that... Uh, psychedelic research program or a trial requires a lot of different people and even more than requiring people, it really requires a lot of different skills and so a trial needs clinicians and therapists but it also needs statisticians, it needs if there's a neuroimaging component, people who really know neuroimaging, it needs people who are very good at experiment design and so I feel like the way to get into this field is to get actually just build up really good skills at any of the elements of you know, being a psychologist or a clinician or a researcher. So I don't feel that there's necessarily like one specific thing that you need that gives you the key to get into psychedelics. It's what you really need is just general skills that will make you a valuable part of a research team. And so, um, you know, often if I have undergraduate students coming to me asking for advice, that's the sort of thing that I really encourage is just to try and do really well at the, the general skills and maybe find some specialty area that maybe isn't content related. It's not like... Um, knowing a lot about psychedelics is the key ingredient. I think it's more about the, the general research skills. Yeah, what do you think? yeah no, I would agree with that. I think in, I get frequently um, uh, receive emails from people, how do I get into this as a therapist? And uh, so I can speak to that for a moment. But I think the first thing I would say is go and be a therapist. Go and get seasoned. You need some scar tissue. <laughs> you need to know how to deal with uh, situations that can come up, a variety of different clinical situations that can come up. It's not just about the psychedelic. That, that you know, I think um, if you have an interest in that, if you have a love, um, that, that, that will come. But be a therapist first. You may have situations that come up in the, the dose experience and you'll have to pivot very quickly. So you need to know uh, how to respond to those situations, know how to work with trauma, know how... Uh, to, you know, to do trauma-informed work, um, uh, you know, get, getting a sense of how to sit with different um, uh, populations. Different. It's looking like it's largely going to be a mental health, um, or large, largely sort of land in, in the mental health domain. There, there is going to be some interface with medical conditions, including functional disorders, as well as um, for us, for example, palliative medicine. Um, so, yeah, go and as exactly as Vince said, you know, go and get get qualified first, go get some experience, go roll around in the, in the dirt for a little bit and get seasoned. Um, and that will really, I think, equip you very well. Yeah, I think the, the, uh, we always talk about integration. We talk about people going through psychedelic experience and then integrating. Um, I think we need integration for therapists too. Mm, I yeah. think we need to start thinking about how our models fit together, mm -hmm, how we yeah. work on different levels, how we are researchers Absolutely. and clinicians and how we incorporate the, the mm -hmm. spiritual aspects. Yeah. Um, and so it really is a case of broadening your experience as much agree. as you possibly can. Yeah. 
I would agree with that too. I think, you know, there's a whole th- we've our whole team has been so impacted by the work. It has completely changed us personally, professionally. We've all kind of gone through an experience of, I think, of ontological shock, um, seeing such transcendent experiences in our participants. We kind of ride the highs with them. We feel the crushing lows with them when it doesn't work out the way that they would like. So, you know, I think um, there's, there's a lot of... There's a lot of um, growth and an area that we're going to have to nurture this um, in a... Oh, sorry, no, I've taken it off a track a little bit, but, but I think um, I would absolutely agree with that. We need to think about how we integrate um, into this system too. Yeah. Anything else on that? All right, panel, what's next for Australian psychedelic research? What are you excited about? What are you worried about? I'm excited about trials uh, in the functional disorders, in uh, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, uh, disorders that are seem to be of people who, I mean, I have patients who come in with di- like drawings of their bodies with like red, you know, texture down one side of it going, this is my pain. Mm-hmm. And I think that these uh, drugs have a in concert with psychotherapy, have a uh, capacity to uh, fundamentally change the way you think about yourself. And so I do think that there's going to be a uh, scope for working with these, what would be traditionally called physical disorders. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good angle, just to think about what possibilities are opened up for sort of moving beyond these beginning stages. I mean, I, I think that... I'm maybe not as pessimistic about the clinical trial model, maybe as some of the other um, comments yeah, from earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that the issues are really real of the, the problems of how do you cram something like a psychedelic sp- experience into a tick box kind of measuring situation. Like that is absolutely a, a tricky kind of problem, but I feel like that is something that we may get past, that there is the potential for um, more clever designs, for designs that aren't as specifically focused on maybe the effects of like one or two sessions, but maybe trials that start to focus more on like the psychedelic almost being a bit incidental to a therapy program and you're really looking at the effects of some form of integration. And so you can see how that might be the thing that you you really focus on. And I think that as we get uh, more experience just as a country and as researchers doing this sort of stuff, that there'll be be more resources, there'll be more openness from universities and research teams and funders to maybe explore things more broadly, I guess, is the the optimistic kind of angle. And that, um, you know, I I think that if we want to approach psychedelics from any kind of scientific perspective, we, we sort of have to... I think we have to have some sort of assumption that there, there is going to be some kind of like measurement of efficacy, and so I, I think there there is potential for us to get good at that and find new ways of doing it. And it seems like we're sort of just starting out on that on that journey. I think one of the things I would like to see is as, is for us to have a bit more courage to have a look at what why things go wrong, mm-hmm. when things mm-hmm. don't work, so that we can learn from that. Yeah, I think there's an awful lot to be gained from being honest. Mm-hmm. and trying to feed that back into our model so that we make sure that, that it has real-world application. Mm. Absolutely. And I'm involved in a study currently that's just about to complete. In fact, it'll be the first completed psychedelic study in Ooh. Australia, I'm happy to say. Um, and <laughs> um, this is actually in a healthy population and, and some elements amongst others that I've been most interested in have been the potential for um, the safeguarding of mental well-being. So I, I, I'm very interested in this angle of preventative mental health mm-hmm. uh, and the con- concept that in otherwise non-clinical or you know non, non um, people who don't have a clearly defined mental health condition, although of course we do all have a clearly defined mental health condition, which is simply in here, um, nonetheless could uh, adapt or adopt psychedelic work to uh, ensure their ongoing mental good health. Mm. Uh, And so this is sort of an element of preventative mental health that I'd like to to see explored further. So I think uh, alongside the very, very um, valid and valuable uh, clinical trials that are underway, I think we should probably be exploring, and I hope we will explore more of this sort of good health model as well. 
Yeah, I would agree with Martin. I think one of the things I'm, I'm probably a little bit mindful of at the moment is that we've got such an emphasis on the medical use of psychedelics, um, which is kind of glorified in the media, but then, you know, um, recreational or spiritual use of it is really still stigmatised and punished, actually. So uh, I'm mindful of hopefully not um, contributing to that, that um, emphasis on, on just medicinal kind of uses for this. I don't think that um, the only way people can access psychedelics should be within the four white walls of a clinic. Um, and if you look at the traditional ways that, that you know, the sacred ceremony, indigenous use of these plants and medicines, um, you know, it was, it was done within a cultural framework, but it was done safely in groups and they may not have had an affliction. This was, you know, as Martin's talking about, you know, it could be um, in a prophylactic sense, uh, a way of, of keeping good mental health. So, um, yeah, I'm mindful of where that's going to head. Uh, and I hope that as researchers, we kind of keep that in mind um, as, we, as we move this forward. Yeah. So that sounded probably more like a worry than anything anyone else talked about. Um, <laughs> in the last few minutes we have left, uh, are any of you worried about anything apart from, um, you know, unduly sort of focusing exclusively on medical use and uh, marginalising or pathologising non-medical use? Yeah. Anything else anyone's seriously concerned about? Just to end on a really upbeat note. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this uh, idea that we're in a mental health crisis 50% of people with depression or whatever, and us uh, not understanding that this is actually a social health crisis, uh, yeah. that we live yeah. in this world Absolutely. that's sort of like yeah. fucking lost the plot, and no wonder people are sick. So, you know, psychedelics yeah. are not going to cure this, yeah. and none of us think we own psychedelics, okay? So none of us think that they should just belong in the clinic walls and none of us think that uh, human suffering can be cured yeah. just in a white box in a clinic either. Yeah. There needs to be like massive societal change, which won't happen, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, I think a really important thing to consider is what I call expectation management. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of concern that perhaps a lot of this is being overhyped and there's been a reasonable amount of that sort of uh, commentary in the, in the media uh, in Australia and globally. Um, and so I think we really need to keep things real and, and I, I would like to, um, personally I'd like to ensure that we, we always maintain quite a balanced conversation, yeah. that, we don't, um, that we don't get our hopes too high, um, but nonetheless of course that we recognise benefits as they're accrued. So very important to manage both risk and benefit and also keep things just well balanced all the way through the discourse. Great. Any other worries? Anyone? That's probably enough worries enough to be worries. getting on with. Um, <laughs> we've yeah, got the time worry, now for some questions warriors. from the audience. So um, I assume that somebody is, is taking care of the logistics there. Um, please say clearly whether your question is for one specific panel member or just for the whole panel. Um, other than that, let fly. Um, so given that um, legalisation of medicalised psychedelics is on the horizon, I'd like to ask you a question about accessibility and affordability for the everyday person. I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that question. Yeah, it is, it's one of those things, accessibility is the thing that keeps me up at night. I am very worried about how it's going to work actually because it will end up being that only you know, people who are privileged and have means can then access this in this way. We, we do need some more research in terms of um, Health economics, like in terms of utilisation of healthcare costs, it's the only way someone like Medicare is going to listen, is if we can show, oh yeah, it's actually reducing, you know, um, uh, need for more intense treatments, ongoing treatments, because they're expensive as well. Um, but, yeah, I think it's, it's a difficult question. There's going to be uh, people who are going to try and make a lot of money out of this, hmm. unfortunately. Um, and... You know, I think, personally, because I'm like, going, how is this going to work? Um, and one of the things that I do think about is that it's going to come down to that. I think the personal ethics of each person that ends up delivering this treatment as well, you know, um, are they just in this for the cash, you know? Um, are they 
uh, going to make provision for, you know, treating people. Um, it's, it's actually in our code of ethics in the Australian Psychological Society. You know, our code of ethics is that we have to provide a certain amount of treatment for free, or should give back to the community in some way. Um, and I think that that it's going to end up being, you know, uh, do you have, you know, room for your, you know, in maybe four days a week in your private practice, you see people who can pay. One day a week when you can't. Um, you know, you see people who, who can't afford the, the treatment. So um, I'm really unsure about how it's going to work. We have to get more creative with our models. I know that they're looking overseas at having maybe one therapist um, as opposed to two second-generation psychedelics looking at a shorter duration. So then it's um, a little bit more affordable in terms of therapist time because that is the thing that costs the most in all of this is therapist time um, and holding that space with people. So... Yeah, we, we have to think more deeply about this, but it's a, it's a good question and a very important one. Yeah. Is medicalisation the end goal? Does anyone have thoughts on where psychedelic use can be legally incorporated after or alongside medicalisation? So medicalisation, I, I regard as something of a strategic move over the last 10 to 15 years to really bring, the, bring psychedelics back into the public conversation and discourse. Um, I don't think it could have happened otherwise, and I'm very happy to, you know, sort of have a really good, vigorous conversation with people about this because I can't really see, uh, I couldn't really see prior to this conversation developing how that was going to break through. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, I, I by no means feel that this is the end game, um, and that medicalisation should take its place alongside other um, decrim and legalisation approaches. Uh, I'd say most of us on this panel, if not all, are, are quite strong proponents of cognitive liberty and, and sort of a broader accessibility of psychedelics. So um, I would hope that medicalisation eventually turns out to be a way of bringing psychedelics into the, into the, um, the general sort of community consciousness so that we can have the conversation about how to bring this, how to make them more accessible and how to essentially make them legal, decriminalised, acceptable approaches to living our lives. That's all. Hi, thank you guys so much. This has been a really uh, valuable experience. Um, I have a background in art therapy, and uh, art therapists are acutely aware of the problems in research around the inevitable nature of expression and experience, and so if you want good advice, go to them. <laughs> but um, the question I actually have is around uh, in, in the trials and in the research, has there been any suggestion or consideration or, or discussion around how creative expression might play a role in the way the subjective experience is collected during research? Because I keep hearing that like, we're trying to solve the you can't tick the box thing, and I'm like, yes, totally. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, just any thoughts around have you ever encountered that? Is that something you're curious about? Do you know of any trials in Australia where that's being included? I would love to say thank you for your question. We actually incorporate art and um, creative therapy within our actual treatment. Um, and we have a mixed model, so it's not just, um, uh, obviously, the, the quantitative, which is, you know, the checklist, but we do a lot of interviewing. We do a lot of interview where we can hand it over to the person and get them to tell us, in their words, what has been most helpful um, aspects of the, of the treatment. Um, what they've experienced, as much as they can put into words. But we also have, um, with our participant um, um, consent, of course, examples of artwork, um, things that they have created, things that they have drawn, sketched, journaled, um, um, coloured, um, poetry that has been written. Like it's, uh, the, the creative therapies have a big place here because we cannot just speak in one language and we can we're, we're telling more than we can know anyway. So language really falls short here um, in, in so many ways. And certainly there's a way of, and I'll talk about this next, we do need to create a narrative in terms of making sense of um, these very powerful and profound experiences or even troubling experiences that people can have during their psychedelic experience. But um, uh, the, the importance of the, it, art and music cannot be... Uh, overstated here so and we will need people like you we will need the art therapists we will need the musicians we will need the we we need uh, the creative therapists here I love what we you know, Vince was saying before you know we need to be skilled and skilled in a number of ways and there's kind of a, a I think um, when you see a lot of the, the kind of the luminaries like Martin and so you see people who have got an interest in music who've got an interest in the arts they're also got an interest in the science they're really kind of uh, uh, 
multi-skilled in, in lots of ways, but we, we need more languages. You know, psychedelics just do not have just one language of science or talking. You know, there's, there's also creative expression. Thank you for your question, it's wonderful. We can go for another audience question as well. The recent one has already been answered earlier. Thanks. Uh, I'm a bit of a dreamer and uh, I've been looking at the grassroots campaigns in North America such as Decriminalised Nature and the success that they've had such as in Oregon. Uh, and I'm wondering hypothetically if we were able to get our shit together in Australia and run such a campaign here uh, and got it, say, legalised tomorrow. Um, do you think we're ready for that? What do you actually think would happen in, the, in the, the medical system to actually cope with the amount of demand that might come out of that? Um, and I guess just to frame that a bit more, um, I really see in the medical model that is, the, the, the mainstream medical model that's being pushed and this medicalization push, uh, a real lack of urgency. Um, and you know, uh, Karen talks about you know, this, this social collapse and you know, the real scale of the problem that we're facing. And I just really get a sense that we shouldn't be waiting for clinical trials that are gonna take a really long time when there's people that are currently suffering. And so I'm wondering what are the actual ways that we might be able to manipulate the current medical model that we have to make space for what Karen and Marg are talking about where people actually have the, the right to experiment and see which treatments work for themselves and treat themselves as, you know, this is me, this is my own clinical trial right here, why, why can't I have access and the right to try a drug? And, and how would the medical system make space for that? I think there's a lot tied up in <laughs> what you've just asked about, so I'm just going to try and respond to a couple of little bits of it. And one part that I think is really important is the distinction between like the uh, medical provision of psychedelics and cognitive liberty or people using psychedelics in their own way. So I think Martin was spot on before, like I think all of us here are very much in favour of cognitive liberty. People have used psychedelics for, you know, um, dozens of years and, and whether or not uh, it becomes an accepted medicine isn't going to change a lot of that sort of underground use. So I feel like there's quite a difference between someone um, wanting to take their own, you know, kind of uh, approach to exploring psychedelics. And there's absolutely risks with that, and it should be done carefully. And, and people, but but I guess what I'm trying to say is it seems fundamentally different to me someone doing that of their own accord compared to someone engaging with a medical system where there's a medical professional with authority who is providing something as a cure. And I feel like there's a completely different level of sort of safety and um, uh, support that's needed in those two situations. And when you've got it as part of the medical system, I feel like we really do need to know that it does work, who it works for, and, and sort of what the ongoing support is. And so when people talk about like, why can't we just have it as part of the medical model now, I feel like it's not clear who these therapies work for and don't work for. We don't know a lot about what happens with sort of like real world populations when it's not just a really homogenous selected sample for a particular trial and we don't know really the level of care that's needed afterwards. So and, until we are really confident of that, I don't think it can be part of the medical system and I don't think we should be like pushing to, to, to provide those things before we can really make sure that people are going to be safe. That's my view. Um, and can I just ask what Karen thinks about, uh, you know, the way that cannabis has been able to be opened up where, you know, there's, there's very little risk for cannabis and so people are able to use it for any condition that they want. And how would that apply to other psychedelics when you actually look at the overall level of risk? Like, I think that psychedelics and cannabis used as a low-dose uh, daily treatment for a chronic condition are two really different uh, circumstances. Um, I, I completely agree with everything that Vince said. Uh, if we're, you know, if I'm going to sit there in front of a patient and say I'm going to give you this psychedelic therapy, uh, I would want to know that that is going to be helpful to that patient. Uh, whereas giving a small dose of cannabis every day to somebody 
who uh, is suffering a complaint is very different to taking them into an intensive psychotherapy over a week or two and dosing them and then being there. And we also don't have anyone, that, enough people who are trained. Uh, if it were made legal, if psychedelic psychotherapy were made legal uh, and available tomorrow medically in Australia, then there would just be huge people opening franchise clinics, you know, staffed by people who didn't give a shit and just wanted to make a lot of money. That medically, that's the, you know, if it were to be legal medically. Does that, that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Can I, I, have, I just want to say one thing, just to close off, if that's right. Um, I don't want to make too much light of this, but one or two people in the room might, have, might recall my 2011 talk, the inaugural Drug Darwin Awards. Um, and one of the key images in that was a stick figure of a guy with flames coming out of this, his back saying, I did try this at home. Um, and so I think we do have to be careful. The medical, the medical system is inherently... Um, conservative and very safety conscious and I really do think we do need to, w there will be an end to this research insofar as the research will never end but there will be an end to this current research campaign because these drugs are likely to be, or these, these compounds, substances, psychedelics are likely to be approved sooner or later within the medical model. Um, and that will probably lead to a greater conversation about decriminalisation and so on. But in the meantime, we do have to be patient, we have to be careful, and we have to keep the, keep the conversation real. So with absolutely respect to your position, I think we do need to um, maintain a sort of, a, a, as a research community, as a medical community, we do have to maintain a sort of a sense of... of, um, uh, of care. Uh, we have a responsibility of care to people who are not able to make as, um, as informed a choice as perhaps you and I could. Thank you, Martin. And let's all thank the panel members for their courageous, fascinating and balanced discussion.